All right, to start the overall presentation, we want to give you Vietnam's risk rating right off the bat, and then we're going to go in depth to why we believe it's at this rating throughout the presentation. Um, so the overall risk rating is a B at the moment. Um, so it's just below acceptable risk. Um, and throughout the presentation, we'll go through why this is. Um, to give us a little bit of background on the country information, Vietnam is uh, currently at 93.6 million people. Uh, their GDP by purchasing power parity is at $647.4 billion. And as you can see in the graph on the right, it has been a constant growth increase year over year. Um, it's had a 6.8 growth rate for the last few years. Um, as you can see on the right, it has bounced up and down. Um, in 2014, it was at about 6%, and it raised up to a little over 65 uh, But then it dipped down again to a little um, in the middle of 6 and 6.5%, but it's back up to about 6.8%. Um, currently, they're at 6913 per capita. Uh, their unemployment rate is at 2.1%, and inflation is at 3.5%. Also, the FDI inflow is at $14.1 and Vietnam is a WTO member. Uh, Vietnam is a communist country that is led by four key positions. Um, that's party chief, president, Prime Minister, Head of National Assembly. Um, they are ranked 117th out of 180 countries in the Corruption Perception Index in 2018. Um, that's not a very good number, but they're also not the most corrupt um, country in the world. I mean, they're right in the middle. As you can see on this map, um, yellow is the least corrupt, um, red is the most corrupt. Um, they're right in the middle between there, so I, I said, as I said before, they're not the most corrupt, they're not the least corrupt, but they definitely have some corruption in, in the country. Um, since the last Prime Minister left, which was, I believe, 2016, um, they've made progress in protection corruption by strengthening its anti-corruption legal framework and prosecuting corrupt individuals, especially in the energy and banking sectors. Due to that, there have been over 100 people who arrested and jailed and given death sentences. So you can see that Vietnam is just trying really hard right now to get rid of corruption in this country and lead to a better future in terms of corruption. Um, they are one of five remaining communist countries in the world. Um, the president is the head of the republic. The prime minister is the head of the government. There are three branches like the United States has. They have the legislative, executive, judicial branch. Um, the executive is the government and the president. And then the legislative is the National Assembly of Vietnam. As you can see, this is a picture of the National Assembly of Vietnam. And judicial is like the courts like we have in the United States. Um, elections are every five years. You have to be at least 18 years old to vote. Um, and uh, property rights, as a you know, foreign investor, it's very hard to uh, buy property in Vietnam unless if you have some sort of connection in Vietnam. Foreign buyers off, have often faced barriers of buying real estate in Vietnam, including the limitation of law and foreign ownership portion of each property project. So they can only, off, they can only own 30% of a project. Um, foreigners have a hard time of getting certificates of ownership, which is a pretty big deal. Um, in order to acquire property, they must follow these three guidelines. I mean, a company has to be established in Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam, Vietnam company must be shared with a foreign stakeholder. Um, the, comp the company must not have any link to real, real estate in Vietnam. Um, in terms of property rights index, uh, they rank 76 out of 125. Just like the corruption, they're right in the middle. I mean, it could be a lot worse, it could be a lot better, but this right in the middle. Um, this graph gives like a better description of like what I'm talking about. Like, as you can see, like the scores are, are, are pretty decent, but they could be a lot better. Um, so as an overall business, international businessman, I, I think it would be very, it's not impossible, but it's a little bit difficult to invest in Vietnam. All right, so for uh, levels of violence, um, just a couple of quick statistics that we found during, during our research. Uh, Vietnam is the 83rd safest country according to the Global Finance Report of 2019. Um, and that report uses uh, the three factors of war and peace, uh, personal security, and then natural disaster, disaster risk um, to kind of calculate that. Um, so depending on where the country is, um, what conflicts they're in, um, that all goes into the equation uh, for where the countries land on the, that list. Um, and then Vietnam is 60th in the 2018 Global Peace Index. Um, and again, those three factors that go off that are societal safety 
and uh, security, ongoing domestic and international conflict, and then uh, militarization. Uh, so again, uh, depending on uh, all the things that go going on in the country, those are the three big factors that kind of go into the equation and, and land that. Um, and again, these were out of about uh, 120 ish and then 140. Um, so again, pretty good numbers for Vietnam there. Um, and then one really amazing uh, thing that we found when doing our research is that they're only one of 10 countries uh, not at war as of, uh, in the 2016 Global Peace Index. Um, even if and we, that even if that is still true today, uh, that's just a crazy statistic that we just thought would be uh, really important to highlight there. Um, number of armed insurrections. Uh, first, we wanted to define what this was before kind of going into uh, some of the uprisings and stuff that they had. Uh, so our definition was an open resistance of a large group of people uh, against rulers of that specific country. Um, so again, we kind of see these all throughout uh, history in different, different countries, uh, and, and Vietnam is no different. Um, so again, um, going back to the 1800s, uh, from 1880 to 1940, uh, they had several small uprisings um, as they were a colony of the French. Um, they sought independence from Japan and French following uh, World War II. Um, so that was a constant ongoing battle there uh, internally. Um, and then once they kind of had that independence, they had a bunch of um, small internal conflicts between the nor Northern Vietnam and Southern Vietnam. Um, and these three suppressions right here uh, were just um, some ones that we found all occurring in 1955 that really held some weight. Um, and then again, anti gm coup in 1963. Uh, and then finally, even going ongoing today are a lot of ethnic and religious group tensions um, that kind of stems back from the Northern and Southern uh, armies and uh, that conflict there. Uh, and then going and talking about some of the conflicts with other countries, um, we see that they were occupied by France and Japan during World War II, so that was a, that was the start of a lot of it. Um, and if we look at kind of how this map is laid out, we see Vietnam here right along the coast. Um, they have borders with uh, Cambodia, Laos, and then China up here. Um, so that kind of led to uh, why Japan wanted access there that was easy for them in a good spot during World War II. Um, and again, the Vietnam War, again, North Vietnam versus South Vietnam. Um, it was kind of right in the heat of the Cold War with uh, Russia and the United States. Um, so just a lot of conflict going on there. Uh, and then the Cambodia Civil War and the Laotian Civil War. Um, again, because uh, Laos is right here and Cambodia is right here, they share borders with Vietnam. Um, so Vietnam is going to be affected uh, by what's going on uh, because they share that border. Um, and then the, Viet, uh, the Vietnamese and Cambodia War, again, just border conflicts going on there. Uh, so just that's some of the uh, conflicts going on with Vietnam. In 2018, Vietnam's inflation rate was calculated at 3.5%. This was down from their inflation rate in 2017, which was calculated at 4.4%. They don't have a very long history of inflation since they were, became a country in 1976 but the short history that they do have is a very volatile one. In the first few years of the country being formed, they were reached a max of around 500%, as you can see on the chart. But since then, they've started to decrease and have been able to stabilize since the turn of the century. They also changed their economic rate system in 2011. This economic rate system became a currency uh, basket peg system Instead of a straight peg system to the US dollar, the Chinese yen, and then to the markets. They are now floating a little bit more and have eight different pegs that they go to. This has a few different advantages. This prevents the dong, the Vietnam currency, uh, from dropping too sharply and also helps with them controlling inflation. And this helps stabilize their macro economy and all of their imports and exports. However, the reverse side of this is that the country must have foreign exchange reserves in order to keep their currency level with others. And this can be artificially driven down by other company, other countries hoping to short on Vietnam's dong. All right, moving on to government spending. Um, Vietnam is currently at the highest government spending they've ever been at. And this is at $325 trillion. Um, and the record low is at $3 trillion. 
So as you can see in the graph um, down below here, in the past just almost 10 years, they have just they have grown dramatically in um, government spending. Um, in terms of wasteful spending, however, we did not find much wasteful spending. Um, in the graph on the right here, the, uh, the black lines represent the current investment in spending, and the purple lines um, are for the current demand. Um, and as you can see, every single current investment is below the demand. So they're not even reaching the demand levels yet. Um, and the most money that's being allocated towards is energy. And this makes sense because Vietnam is one of the world's largest energy um, producers of if natural, natural gas and petroleum. Um, so a lot of the money is gonna be allocated there. And as far as wasteful spending, however, goes, there is not much wasteful spending. Vietnam as a resource-based country is split fairly evenly between the North and the South. The North has a heavy reliance on mining of coal and petroleum, and about 30%, 31% of the workforce in the North works either in the coal mining or in the quarry business. Uh, this is also home of the world's third largest bauxite iron reserve, and there's a lot of mining of the iron ore in this region. Um, the oil that's produced in North Vietnam and mined in North, North Vietnam is actually the third largest production in the Southeast Asia and goes to a lot of countries like China and India. In the southern part of the country, they rely mainly on agriculture and timber production. 23% uh, of the south of the country is agricultural land and this is where most of the hydropower and timber come out of, come from in uh, Vietnam. In conclusion, as a group, we would say investing in Vietnam right now would not be the best decision. The tax rate for corporations is very high. Uh, it's difficult to purchase real estate, as Tim has already said. Uh, it's mid-range uh, inflation, but it's very volatile. And the low to mid-level GDP is a bit concerning, but the GDP is increasing. Um, we would say that it would be worth investing in Vietnam if the corporations decrease or if the corporation tax decreases and the GDP increases and inflation stabilizes.